Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to a very, very, very special episode of Raw Law Unfiltered with your host of the DUI Guy Plus. Today, folks, is a day I actually never thought would come. Uh, you know, some things are kind of out of my hands. Uh, at least they were at one point. Um, if you all remember, one of the things that I became known for during the uh, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard jury trial in Fairfax, Virginia, was the simple fact that her um, testimony, when she took the stand, when I actually went there, I began taking notes and live tweeting them and then making these types of videos at the end of courtroom testimony. Well, somebody gave me a very brilliant idea on the last day of testimony and actually the last day that I got into the courtroom because the final day during closing arguments, uh, a certain someone or someones inhibited my ability um, to get into the courtroom on that Friday, which was a blessing in disguise. I just didn't know it yet. So, uh, but of course, at the time I was very upset, but before we even got there, on that Thursday, the last day of testimony, that was uh, testimony of Gilbert, Hughes, Ackert, and Amber Heard herself on uh, rebuttal and surrebuttal. I had about, I don't remember, 20-some, maybe 30-some-odd pages of notes in, you may remember this little gem, the notebook. This is the notebook that I was taking notes in. And as you can see, these are the original signatures. I don't know if y'all can see that. Yep, there we go. These are the signatures of the line people from May 25th, 2022, which was, I think, the Tuesday or the Wednesday. And then from May 26th. So if you sign this notebook, this is it. This is the original. Um. This is not some copy. This is the original notebook. I am back in possession of it from the auction winner who so graciously uh, allowed me, because they live in Kentucky. Um, they're not far from me. They so graciously allowed me to take possession of this notebook once again. And since Netflix, in their infinite wisdom, I know what they're going for. They're going for clicks and likes and unsubscribes really is what they're looking for. So many people have been dumping their subscriptions because they're premiering the Depp v. Heard uh, documentary, which uh, aired in England back in like April or something in the UK. Well, um, I kind of skimmed through it. I watched the, the first episode, realized it's a whole lot of nonsense this morning because uh, it aired, I think at like three o'clock in the morning our time. And so I decided to skim just the, the the second and third episodes. Again, it's not worth the watch. It has absolutely nothing to add. It only detracts. It tries to paint. It looks like it tries to paint a picture that social media somehow had an influence. And of course, social media did have an influence on people in general. I mean, that's what social media does. Hello, welcome to reality mainstream media. But the problem is it didn't have any influence on the jury because the jury knew that they're not allowed to look at social media and they honored the code based on everything that we have seen. So there was absolutely no impact except for one moment, which, by the way, Amber, did. I completely forgot about this moment because I wrote it down in the notebook because I was there and I listened to her testify. So I was like. This is amazing. She brought the internet into the courtroom herself. And I tweeted about it uh, not 30 minutes ago. So, or X, what do you call it now? Like every time I'm going to go on that website now, I'm going to be thinking about all my exes. Like that's not a good business strategy, Elon. I mean, totally neither here nor there. But 
every time a, a user goes on the platform, they're going to think and remember their exes. Like, mm, maybe not the best. We kind of try to take our exes and, and keep them there. You know what I'm saying? But justice for the line. I mean, I had to relive so many moments going through this. Um, justice for the line. Justice for Johnny. All the the interviews that I've done that never aired because I was speaking and t telling uh, I think uh, I, I will not I will not name the networks I will not I don't want to throw the networks under the bus even though they fucking probably deserve it but <laughs> there were several networks I gave interviews to not one interview aired why because I did not say what they were expecting me to say they expected me to say that Amber is the victim and she deserves to win and blah 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 and each time I was like look you want me to tell you the truth. Yes, the truth is Johnny's going to win. Johnny's going to win. And they're like, yeah, that does not fit our narrative. So we're, we can't air that. But sorry. Thanks. Bye. And um, so the interviews never aired. And you know what? I'm happy for it. Because that taught me to distrust mainstream media even more. Because up until that point, it was all kind of hearsay. I kind of saw what they did. But now they did it to me. And of course, subsequent events also have led to even more distrust of mainstream media as I went to other trials, such as the uh, Alec Murdoch murder trial in South Carolina, the Kristen Smart murder trial in uh, Salinas, California, the Danny Masterson trial, the, um, what's his name, Harvey Weinstein trials. All of those trials that I've been to have also kind of reinforced that idea. But the foundation was built at the Johnny Depp trial. That was my first real exposure to mainstream media in such a um, condensed milk, if you will, version of events, right? So anyway, um, thank you, by the way. Um, I will not mention their name. The auction winner of the notebook. Your money, which you have paid $14,969, almost $15 thousand dollars have been donated to the children's hospital of los angeles if you don't know what i'm talking about you have to go back to my tweets from june july and august of 2022 uh i auctioned off this notebook you all may remember those of you who don't know i'm going to tell you uh so these are the notes that i took for the two weeks that i was there minus a few days uh at the trial so a collective of six days over the course of two weeks, I was inside the courtroom, and five of those days, I took notes, and I tweeted about them. And so uh, the idea came to me literally in the spur of the moment, one day that a couple of law tubers didn't get in, and they were taking notes, so I figured I should take notes for them. And then I got the idea, what if, because no one is doing it, I, I literally become not one of the sources, I become the source. It's insane. It's just that once the realization hit me, I didn't even know what type of gold mine I have just uncovered. Um, so yeah, I'm sporting my, uh, by the way, you lost here, have a mega pint, uh, pint glass. If you don't have one, you guys, water tastes everything, water, what juice, orange juice, Gatorade, whatever you want to put in here. It tastes so much better when you drink it out of this glass. Like, I'm not even joking. I, I have been proven time and time again. The link is in the description below. Feel free to go check it out. Get one. They're amazing. They're absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad to have mine. And it's got Johnny with a with a mega pint glass on it. It's just, it's amazing. Amber, you lost here. Have a mega pint. So the final day, the final day uh, was never published. Because on the final day, on May 26, 2022, little did I know I wasn't going to get in the courtroom the following day, thanks to a certain someone. <laughs> but again, it was a blessing in disguise. I just didn't know it at the time. Um, the whole ordeal, the whole ordeal was orchestrated to generate maximum revenue for the children. And I realized if I want to add value to this notebook, the best way of accomplishing it 
is to leave something in it that the purchaser, the buyer can claim and say, I'm in possession, not only of something, because a lot of it has been published, like 80% of it, 90% of it has been published, right? Four out of five days or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, four out of five days have been published. So how do I add more value to it? Ah, by having something exclusive in it. And the exclusivity came from the material uh, that I wrote down on the last day that was never published on Twitter. And it stayed hidden inside this secret notebook until today. Today, I have already gone through the liberty. Like I said, it brought back so many memories of the courtroom. As I was typing it all out, in, which I'm about to read to you, uh, just like I did in days of old, the final day of testimony, uh, it, it brought back so many memories. It brought back memories of Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa, by the way, if you're watching, I know that she replied to a few of my tweets earlier today. Uh, James, James is always missing in action. Everybody's like, where's James from court? I'm like, he's fine. Leave James the fuck alone. James is doing his thing. And everybody's like, but we haven't heard from him. Let him live his life. Let him do whatever he wants to do. You're right. You know, he's, he doesn't owe you anything, but I want to know. No, you don't. No, you don't want to know. You don't care. But I do care. No, you don't. Sit. All right. That's my response to like every time somebody brings it up. Uh, James is doing fine. Leave him alone. So this is the original notebook. And we're going to start with Gilbert. He is. So remember, we have to teleport back in time. So imagine this is uh, May 26, 2022. I just got back to my little cozy, uh, I can't even call it an Airbnb because it was a fellow attorney in uh, uh, literally a mile away from the courthouse who so graciously allowed me to stay there. And um, <laughs> I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm going, oh, this is like a gold mine, but I want to add value. And so here it is. The first thing that I do, and uh, I'm, we're just piling into the courtroom, it's probably 8.50-something, 8.40-something. Um, remember, the previous day, so what day is it? It's Thursday. It's Thursday, May 26. Tomorrow are closing arguments, and the verdict will come the following week after the weekend. So it's Thursday. Now, the day before, which was Wednesday, May 25th, Okay, 2022, uh, a certain someone by the name of Morgan Tremaine, you may or may not have heard of him by now, also known as TMZ guy, also known as Spicy Draco. Uh, he has taken the stand the previous day and testified on rebuttal for the plaintiff. I had, <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face anymore. I had a natural reaction in the courtroom to the testimony that blew everything out of the water. It was like a nuke that literally went off in the courtroom. Somebody didn't like it from the legal tube community. And I was literally contemplating how I'm going to call her out, which I never did. By the way, it remained uh, it remained buried in my notebook all these months, 15 months, to, almost almost a full 15 months. And uh, <laughs> I literally wrote, I got into the courtroom without any problem. Same with James and Vanessa. Go ahead and like screenshot her message and call her out, you know, later today or whatever. And I never did that. I never did that. I'm not that petty. Maybe I am, but at least I got it out in writing. I got it out of my system and I, I never followed through with it. Um. Then uh, the court reporter, uh, which we ran into uh, in the hallway as she was walking to the courtroom. So this is probably around like 845, 840, something like that. She confirms that Camille Vasquez has one of those. So I have to, I have to give you the backstory. Uh, she has a shirt that says, what if anything at the front? And then legal to hashtag legal tube uh, or law tube, whatever it was in the back, right? So I was in Canada. Back then I was uh, dating DUI babe. You all may remember she's Canadian. So I just got back from Canada because I was visiting her. 
and I had 25 shirts made. Uh, and I was giving them all out for free. It cost me like, I don't know, $800 or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, and I was just handing them out for free. I kept one for myself, which I don't even know where it is anymore. But those shirts ended up in places where I did not even expect them to. Uh, I believe Ben Chu had one. I didn't write that down. I don't remember why. Maybe that's why I wasn't sure. But one thing I was sure about, and that is the court reporter confirmed that Camille Vasquez has a shirt. And I saw one of my shirts on her desk that day, that morning on Thursday, May 26th. And so, and I even, I spoke to one of the line sitters who came up to me, or not line sitters, sorry, uh, audience members at the trial. And they came up to me at the end of the trial that day, or maybe during a break or something, I can't remember, it's been so long, and confirmed that she was the one to hand Camille a shirt. So it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Because I brought them in, I think I handed them out that Monday, and this was Thursday. So these shirts ended up in all nook and cranny. I think I think the court reporter had one too. It was really, really freaking cool. Um, and then I, I make a note that Legal Tube is going to help law and crime get in the courtroom tomorrow. I heard they're having trouble. Again, I have no clue what I'm referring to. I don't remember. It's been so long, but it's in my notes. Um, now, very shortly before the judge walks into the courtroom, Amber Heard turns around and gives the law tube and crew a condescending glance. No F me eyes this time around. <laughs> because remember, a week prior, she was uh, looking at the three well, sharp dressed men in the courtroom and giving us all the, mm -hmm -hmm. are you here for me? And we're like, no, Amber, no, <laughs> you have the wrong idea. She's like, my sugar daddies have arrived. No, they haven't. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Oh, God. I used, to, I used to think that Rob and Ian would back me up on this, but to this day, they're I think they're too scared. Uh, but they saw it too because we talked about it. Ask them. <laughs> it's just one of those things where I think they're like, it's already buried, bury the hatchet. What's the point? which I respect. I, I, I get that, but I will, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just a master of the truth, I guess. I'm not afraid to say it. If it happened, I will say it. You know, if it didn't happen, then obviously I won't say it. So. <sighs> oh, we got Amy in the house. Is it the Amy that I think Amy Goodhart or no? Yes. Ah, Amy's in the house. Amy. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Welcome back. It's been a long, long time. Um, hello, everyone. Just coming in. So here we are, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, Amy's the best. Uh, <laughs> uh, how's Suki, by the way? I hope Suki's doing. Suki is her dog that she adopted, like right around the time when I came to visit, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure. Tell us how how Suki is in the chat. Um. So 9 a.m., there's a bench conference, and there's a witness sitting, which I later learned is uh, Dr. Gilbert, the ortho that testified for the uh, plaintiff, Johnny, earlier. And the jury walks in at 9.03, and juror number four is looking lovely as always. I make a note of that. And I also make a note, uh, it struck me throughout the trial, and I just made a note of it here, that the clerk swears in witnesses, not the judge. Because like in Kentucky, the judge swears in witnesses. I think in California as well. I could be wrong. But um, I can't remember. I can't remember. But in Kentucky, a judge always swears the witness in. But the clerk was swearing in the witness in Virginia. I always found that odd. But hey, who am I to say? They did the same thing in uh, South Carolina, by the way. I just remembered the clerk hands out a Bible too, which was also new to me because we don't do that in Kentucky uh, and swears the witness in. So Gilbert, Dr. Gilbert gets on the stand. Everybody's scribbling stuff down on direct examination. Remember, this is still Johnny's lawyer. Uh, 
And Vanessa turns to me and says, Whitney, uh, I was about to say Whitney Houston because it's the same acronyms. Whitney Heard, which I think she calls herself Whitney Rodriguez or something. I guess she married. Uh, but we all still call her Whitney Heard just for clarity because everybody's like, who the fuck is Whitney Rodriguez? No, Whitney Heard, her sister. <laughs> Vanessa points out that Whitney has a pattern. And the pattern is that she wears her hair down in the morning but up in the afternoon, and she's like, is, does she want to be talked about? And we make a note to see if the pattern repeats, not only after I tweet this, which I never did. So, And we never had an afternoon that day because we were, we were out of there right after lunch, uh, as the case concluded three hours later. But we didn't know that, obviously, at the time. Uh, Johnny's lawyer, the young gentleman, which whose name I couldn't remember, and uh, you all in the chat can probably help us out. Um, he seems like he knows to do how to do a good job on direct examination as he is direct examining uh, Dr. Gilbert. And I kind of make a note, let's pay attention to how he does on cross-examination and redirect because those are the important parts. Direct is easy. It's a who, what, where, when, why, and how questions, right? Very, very simple stuff. And, and then what happened? And then what happened? You never asked that question like I just phrased it. And then what happened? But that's essentially what you're asking. And then what did you do? And how did that happen? And when was that? And where was that? Thank you so much. Sit down. You know, that's easy. Anybody can do that. No offense. But it's the easy. But still, it's a high profile case. And they give him an awful uh, a lot of responsibility. At 914, it appears that all jurors are listening very intently to the orthopedic uh, doctor. Dr. Gilbert, and I found it interesting that juror number five that day was staring me down, I wrote this morning. I looked away and back several times, and she was still looking at me. Uh, she definitely remembers me from days prior. Um, 9.16 in the morning, the uh, ortho testifies that the bottle exploded. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, he was the one that was testifying about Johnny's finger injury uh, when Amber threw the glass bottle at his finger and chopped off the top piece, which is just so horrendous to think about. Just so horrendous. Uh, when that, when he said those words, bottle exploded, number two scratched his chin and his head. Number five was listening to Gilbert with peaked interest. And jurors number two and eight nodded slightly. Number two was also seen writing stuff down. Uh, I also made a, an interesting observation that one of Johnny's bodyguards has a skull ring on his right hand's ring finger. Just figured people might be interested in that information. I don't know what it means, but I wrote it down. Uh, 9.21 a.m. Uh, juror number two appears very attentive when the ortho testifies about, quote, the direction of the injury, end quote. Uh, and how could you have a glass injury with no glass in the wound? Number five rubs her eyes. Uh, number one is writing stuff down. Number nine listens intently. That's our favorite juror. Number nine will become a theme today. So pay attention to that. Uh, and number five scans the room. So will number five a little bit. I mean, they're, they're all characters in their own right. Number eight. We're going to have some unprecedented stuff happen on this day. I am guessing maybe because they feel it's coming to a close. They already know, it, you know, you have testimony on for the plaintiff, testimony for the defense. That's all over. Uh, now testimony on rebuttal for the plaintiff, testimony and rebuttal for the defense. And that's it. Case is submitted. There is no more. You go back and deliberate. And usually jurors' minds are already kind of made up by that point because they've heard rebuttal testimony. Unless you have like a, how should I call it? Um like a surprise witness, someone who's going to come in and be like, let me tell you, I have proof, not just testimony, but I have proof that what so-and-so said is incorrect. And here's why that's damning. That is potentially can turn a trial on its head in this trial. As we already know, in hindsight, we didn't know at the time of, of, uh, this all happening. Um, there is no surprise witness. All they did mostly was bring up the the same uh, witnesses that testified previously to kind of say why the other side was wrong. That's it. And that is extremely weak because the jury already either bought your evidence testimony or it didn't. 
And if they didn't, they're not going to suddenly have a eureka moment like, oh, my God, you opened my eyes. Once the conscious decision is made, this is just human behavior, human nature generally, uh, you got to have like a slammer. You got to have something that like really adds an oomph to your to your case. Otherwise, they're just going to be like, you're wasting our time. You're wasting our time. Um. So, uh, they, but they were very interested in, in some of this testimony, it just kind of reminded them, uh, sometimes, not always, as you will see. As her comrade sits down, Camille Vasquez congratulates him on a job well done on direct examination of the orthopedic doctor, Dr. Gilbert, uh, gives him a smile, and he sits down. Now, cross-examination of Gilbert. Right out of the gate... Juror number two looks very disinterested and is looking at the floor and down at his shoes. Uh, appears bored as the cross continues. This is around 9.23, 9.25 a.m. Now, when Rottenborn starts reading the deposition, like Gilbert's deposition back to him, number two purses his lips Number three is playing Ipong between Rottenborn and Gilbert. And what I mean by that is question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Like he, if you remember, number three was fairly young. So I kind of chalked it up to maybe inexperience that everything interests him and everything is cool. Where meanwhile, number two was a bit, well, number two was also a bit young. Number one was older. Uh, there were the three men seated, one, two, and three. And then we had we had number four was the African American female, number five was the Asian woman, number six was our war veteran decorated military guy, number seven who was number seven? I don't remember number seven. Number eight was the lovely older woman, uh, and number nine was our. We we kind of call them like Hawaiian, maybe island type individual, our favorite character. I can't remember number seven for some reason. I think number seven was a, a female as well. But anyway, so hopefully that, that kind of gives you a bit of a preview. Why can't I remember number seven? I guess there was no... Nothing, nothing that stood out about them that, to, I mean, it's been 15 months. I'm, I'm actually quite surprised I remember this much, but uh, I've been doing this all morning. So it, it all, like I said, the memories all kind of came back. Um, so while number three is playing Ipong between Rottenborn and uh, Gilbert, number two is seen reviewing old notes during the back and forth cross. Also, uh, Vanessa, shout out to you. Ven on air with V. Blair, by the way, on Twitter or X or whatever the fuck. Uh, she notices that Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are matching today. And I nearly died. I nearly died. I was like, is she like watching him, like what he's wearing and then like changes before she walks into the courtroom? So she's more, I don't know. It's narcissist psychopaths. They act in ways that are unpredictable. I know I'm going to catch a lot of flack for this right now, but for example, Meghan Markle trying to look like the deceased Princess Diana, more like her now current husband, Prince Harry's deceased mother. Yeah, it's that kind of shit. It's like, I am your person. Like I, I, they elicit emotional responses from their victims. And that's what Amber has been doing. And she continued to do it throughout the trial. Uh, it's just, it's in the narcissist playbook. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you might find some interest in some videos on YouTube, which I have recently, and you'll learn about like covert narcissism, overt narcissism. It's quite fascinating, actually. So if you're into that kind of stuff and you want to learn more about it, there are tons and tons and tons of YouTube videos out there and write uh, written material if you're more into the reading type, if you're more of the reading type. Um, then I made it, I don't know. I wrote, so about them matching, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard matching, I wrote, felt cute, might change in the back later. I, I <gasps> It just hit me. I literally just said it. It's about Amber probably walking in with an outfit and then 
seeing what Johnny's wearing, she's like, felt cute. I'm going to go change in the back to kind of look like him. Hey, I am, I'm an openly admitted former narcissist, by the way. So um, I know I know a lot of the narcissist playbook. I learned from my father, uh, unfortunately. So any learned behavior can be unlearned. Did you know that? Oh, my God. Shocker. Uh, if you choose. Again, it's all about choices that we make. Now, at 9.29 in the morning, number one looks very puzzled by Rottenborn's continued deposition uh, cross on the deposition that Gilbert gave. Because here's the thing, when you don't have to off a, a lot to go on, what you try to do is you try to impeach the witness. Impeaching me means you said something here and that contradicts something here. If you don't have something good, it's just going to fall on deaf ears. You're not really going to be able to, um, how should we say, um, you're not going to be able to make as much of an impact on the listener, right? Because if it's like, you said the car was blue and now you're saying it's light blue. It's like, okay, light, light blue, blue, what's the difference? But if you're like, look, you said the light was green and you crossed the intersection when the light was green and now you just testified the light was red when you crossed. That's huge. That is huge. You literally contradicted yourself directly and you just changed the entire course of the trial. Potentially, right? Just for an example. But Roddenborn didn't have a whole lot to go on with Gilbert. Gilbert already testified at the deposition of certain things. Now he's trying to like find little inconsistencies to discredit him. But it, the, the damage to Amber's case is already done. Number nine is more interested in what's going on in the gallery when that is all happening. And number one is writing stuff down. There was not a single objection, if I remember correctly, because I wrote not even in, no objections were needed. On redirect, number eight begins uh, nodding slightly again. However, she uh, wasn't nodding during the cross-examination by Rottenborn. And she's writing now, and she wasn't writing during the cross-examination by Rottenborn. Gilbert concludes, uh, Johnny's team rests. And at 9.32 in the morning, Sir Rebuttal testimony begins. Now, before Sir Rebuttal testimony begins, it's important to note that the defense only has an hour and 16 minutes of spotlight time left. Uh, if you recall, uh, they both had like 60 or some odd hours when the trial started or something like that. It was more than that. It, that doesn't sound right. Or maybe they did. I don't remember. It was like 120 hour. Maybe somebody can correct me in the chat. I, I don't I don't remember. But the the, the, the plaintiff... Johnny's team had like seven hours and eight minutes, whereas Amber's team had an hour 16 left. So there right now, the clock starts running again. The clock starts running again. The, the, Johnny's team is already done and they still have seven hours in reserve for cross-examination. And of course, they don't use any of that, whereas 61 hours. Okay, thank you. So I, I wasn't totally off. 61 hours. And yeah, I, I, I agree, happy wife, because... If the trial was not timed, it could literally go on for months. Case in point, um, OJ. Remember OJ? The runaway jury? There's literally documentaries made about how insane. Nine months. Jury in prison, I think, was one of the, the, the titles of that trial. The jury in prison. Because they couldn't leave. They had to sit there and continue to listen through nine months of testimony. I mean, that is wild. So 61 hours, 15 minutes each, whatever it was. Thank you, Kim. Um, now the defense has already run through almost the full 60 hours of it. And they have an hour and 15, uh, an hour and 16 minutes left. Let me just do this real quick. Welcome Bessie Knox. Thank you for joining, uh, being a member for nine months. Sorry. Joining as a member, being a member. I don't know. It's finally doing these. This is good. This is good. I like this. Julie, thanks for being a member for nine months. Um, Slayer Selections, there we go. Welcome to the channel. Thank you for joining on as a member. And Danny's World, likewise, thank you for joining on as a member. Um, Rain Nation, thank you for the donation. I want to interview you and show you what I'm working on. How do we make it happen? Hashtag Liberty and Justice for All. Email me. Email me, lforman30 at gmail.com. One of our moderators will happily share that with you in the chat. Uh, and we can talk about it. 
And uh, Rosemary Atardo says, Larry, I totally remember seeing your reaction after the TMZ guy's testimony. <laughs> it was the best. I'll definitely be ordering a glass. Hell yeah. She's talking about this glass, of course. You lost here. Have a mega pint. Link is in the description right below. All right. Let's get back into it. Thank you all for your generosity. Now, there's a sidebar uh, before Julian Ackert. He was the data guy, if you remember. He was the one like talking about photos and data and stuff like that, statistics. It was very dry testimony, but potentially useful if he didn't look like a washed up gargoyle or washed up sales, used car salesman, maybe he would get something accomplished. But uh, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't believe him. During the bench conference, jurors number two, eight, and nine continuously scan the room. Number five is seen reviewing older notes. Number seven is rubbing his eyes. So it was a male. I just couldn't remember. I still can't see his face. It's really killing me now. I see all the other faces. Why can't I see number seven's face in my mind? I don't know. Uh, maybe it'll come to me by the time this is over. Now, number eight is rubbing his face also. They all seem exhausted. I mean, granted, they've been there for six weeks. It's been a very long trial. Um. Yeah, for those of you just joining us, thank you, Water Dragon. So Julian, now on direct examination, Julian Ackert, I actually write, you know, why does he look like a used car salesman? He's very soft-spoken. It's hard to hear him compared to Johnny's witness who just got off the stand. I mean, granted, it's a doctor versus a data analyst. I get it. But he just appears a lot less confident in his own testimony, which is very, very important. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be a homeless person with no job, no career, no nothing. You just saw something happen. You take the stand and you're like, well, and then I saw, you know, that over there. And then I saw, like, you don't appear confident. No one's going to believe you. But if you go like, and then he crossed the street. And I was like, oh, my God, watch out. The car is going to hit you. You're like, that sounds believable. You know, it's a little bit more a character to it. So it doesn't matter who you are as long as you sound believable. Oh my God, like you're going to get hit. Acker did not seem believable, just right out of the gate. Number four, I noticed, put her glasses back on. Now, number eight is writing stuff down. At this moment, at 9.37 a.m., give or take, she's the only one. Uh, Camille smiles at Denison as Acker's credentials are being recited. Number eight even nods periodically at him but i don't know if she's nodding at dennison or if she's nodding at the witness i'm sorry uh i didn't make a note of that and now i confuse myself so maybe she's nodding at the witness i imagine since she appears to be interested in what the witness has to say since she's writing stuff down um even on their own witness which is accurate who's on the stand amber Heard's camp just has this aura of tensity about it like very very tense aura meanwhile johnny depp's camp appears very relaxed I, i'll never forget that that is a visual that is hard to forget especially when emotion is involved anything involving emotion is very easy to remember and i just i remember the the sheer tensity in uh, amongst all her lawyers and amber herself whereas johnny's team was all very very just kind of like you know leading back in their chairs type deal very relaxed even though it's their own witness, Amber's own witness is on the stand and they're still tense. You know, this is this is her time to shine. Like they have no confidence in their own case and it's showing. Um, number seven is also beginning to write stuff down now. Uh, Ackert starts testifying about something involving hashing. I don't even remember what it is. Number eight is writing stuff down. Ben Chu scratches his head. Number two looks bored. Number one looks interested. Um, when Ackert is asked, what is photos 3.0? Number one is writing stuff down. Number two is rubbing his eyes by 9 45 in the morning. Uh, there's testimony that begins to be asked about, uh, 
Julian trying to discredit Johnny's expert on the same stuff. And she appears extremely disinterested in that. She's scratching the back of her head, cocking her head to the top right. And number two begins to rub his eyes again. Um, nobody is writing stuff down by 947 in the morning. Then there's something involving a chart that appears on all their screens. At first glance, number eight looks extremely puzzled uh, as, as to what on earth she's looking at on her screen. Number two stares intently reading his screen. Um, number five doesn't appear to care and he's not even looking at the screen. That's the, the female at, at the end of the row uh, in the back row. Now, I made a very interesting observation here because the defense on direct examination is being very vague, perhaps intentionally so, as to which photos they're talking about. And I'm literally sitting there and I wrote in all caps, you know, which photos are you talking about? The jurors need to know because I was confused. And if I'm confused, they're confused. That's just the way the world works. And you got to clear up any confusion. Because when, if the jurors are confused, they can't value what you're trying to put forth. Now, the flip side to that is you have absolutely nothing. And that is why uh, you, um, that's why you're not being specific. You're hoping that just, because sometimes what the defense will do uh, is to try and like put enough cloud and enough, muddy the waters enough to where you're just like, I don't know what's happening. So I'm just going to give you the benefit of the doubt and uh you know rule in your favor or not rule in favor of the plaintiff or whatever rarely works but if you do it enough case in point oj simpson's trial it may work it just has to be done on multiple occasions not just once and i imagine it was probably done throughout the trial for the most part um, number one is looking puzzled as the cross of ackert continues i think i meant direct but i wrote cross because cross yeah cross doesn't start for another 10 minutes or so, nine minutes. So number one looks puzzled as the direct continues. Um, I also made a note here. I don't think I tweeted about this. So you're getting a first peek uh, at this information. All right, who is the blonde misspelling blonde sitting next to, because I'm sometimes I'm writing so fast. Who's the blonde sitting next to Whitney Hurd on her left-hand side? Is she a spy? Why does she have a mask? She's the one with the mask, sorry. Uh, appears very emotional. I believe it was like Amber's handler, I later learned. But I literally wrote, is it a support buddy for Whitney Hurd? I wouldn't be surprised if she needs one to save face. So uh, 953, uh, we are coming to the almost the conclusion of Ackert's direct examination. Uh, number five has a deep yawn. Number four appears antsy. Number six appears lost with a quizzical look on his face. And number seven scratches his neck. Uh, some of the photos are redacted. I am very upset at this. Uh, I think it detracts from the testimony. I even write on cross-examination, you should show the photos. These are not the ones I was given to by the defense, you know, something like that. It basically show that he's not even looking at the evidence that he's supposed to be looking at and testifying about. That would really kill his credibility. I don't think that happened. Maybe I was confused at that point. And again, confusion does not help anyone. Uh, the defense sometimes thinks confusion may be of assistance, but it usually is a, a tactic that doesn't work. Clarity is where it's at. Clarity. Uh, but if you don't have anything, confusion is all you have. It's the, by the way, also part of the narcissist playbook. Confuse and deny and gaslight. Now, by the time they're concluding with Ackert's testimony, uh, jurors number two, seven, and eight are writing stuff down. Dennison laughs at something towards the end. And Johnny Depp just stares at Ackert. Can't take his eyes off of him. Uh, 9.56 in the morning, there is less than an hour remaining, about 57 minutes by my account. Cross-examination by Johnny's team. Number seven is asleep. Numbers two and five checked out. There's testimony about authentic originals being under oath. Nobody's writing stuff down. 
Amber Heard looks very tense at this moment and is even fidgeting, seen fidgeting with her fingers during cross-examination of Ackert. In hindsight, uh, what I didn't know at the time is my fear, no, excuse me, my suspicion about Amber's fear that her lies and manipulations of the photos are going to be outed. Now, that never came to fruition as much as probably we would have liked, but Amber was worried it might happen, and that's why she was seen fidgeting, because she wasn't fidgeting before. Um, just an observation. Take with it, uh, take from it what you will. Uh, a witness scratch, no, uh, Ackert, during cross, he scratches his face a lot. Remember, he was he was touching his face and scratching it, which is not a good look. It shows deception. It shows when you're, you know, imagine if I was talking and the entire time I would be doing this. It would appear very, you know, disingenuous, like especially like these signs. These are calming signs. These are not, this is not something you want to be doing while you're talking because this is when you're not telling the truth. Uh, usually, not always. Um, 10 02 in the morning, uh, when the cross examination gets heated, juror number two is almost falling out of his chair and looking at his screen. So he's invested in, in this like hardcore. Uh, collectively, the jury appears to have really liked the cross examination. And I think it was by Dennison, if I'm not mistaken. Um, jury number six during a bench conference. Here it is. Okay, so this is the first one. This is one of those golden moments where you're just like, if if I'm on Johnny's team and I see this, I'm like, oh my God, holy crap, this is incredible. Meanwhile, if I'm on Amber's team and I see this, I go, well, fuck me. We are cooked, aren't we? Um, juror number six, during a bench conference, gives a deep look to Johnny's camp. I, don't, I didn't notice which one she was looking at specifically, but it was definitely Johnny's table, and cracks a slight smile. That was the first time in my five or six, whatever days, six days, uh, five days I was taking notes, six days in the courtroom that I have ever seen a juror look at one of the lawyers or or uh, parties and elicit any type of emotion. Like that was huge at the time. That was literally me going, oh. So number six turning around, that was the mail. Right. Yeah. That was the older male, the military, as we called them, uh, the military, uh, former military, um, older gentleman with the white hair. He turned to them and get, and cracked a, a slight smile. That was incredibly huge at the time uh, because we didn't know. Again, remember, we are 10 o'clock in the morning on May 26, 2022. So there is no verdict yet. So every little bit of information is extremely useful. And we'll take anything we can get. At 10.05, one of the jurors, I think number two, looked like he was having, oh, so yeah, Vanessa uh, and I noticed that number two, I'm wondering if she's in the chat, she can confirm this. Um, we literally looked at each other because we saw number two and he was having a, a bit of like a, kind of one of these moments and it was visible and it was continuous and it would not stop. And we tried to like call attention to one of the bailiffs and the bailiffs of course treated us like, Hey, sit down and shut the fuck up kind of thing. And we're like, dude, there's one of the jurors is having, it looks like a seizure. Like we both looked at each other in horror. Like we can't do anything. We can't just like get up and go over there to, to help or anything. We got to alert the bailiffs and the bailiffs are shutting us down. So we just had to sit there and take it and, Luckily, nothing happened. Maybe it wasn't the first time. I don't know. I don't know. But it was extremely shocking to us, and we we tried we tried to get their attention, but it was it was to no avail. So I made a note of that. Um, the bailiff just brushed us off. It's kind of horrific in and of itself. Doctor Hughes, <laughs> our favorite not person, takes the stand. Uh, number two, number five, and number nine are already checked out. Number one and number seven are writing stuff down, however. I made a note that it might be a good idea to not ask Dr. Hughes any questions at all on uh, cross-examination. 
because when you don't ask any questions, you're basically showing to the jury that everything that person just testified to does nothing for our case. That's what you're telegraphing. So imagine a witness takes a stand, excuse me, on sur rebuttal. And they testify and they testify and they testify and they're like, okay, opposing counsel, do you have any follow-up questions? No. Like, what is a person going to think? Like, oh, they that was completely useless. I, I didn't even have to listen to that. You know, and especially if it's true. Uh, but if you have something, you might as well uh, go for it. Go for the uh, go for the the growing or the the gullet. I, I think was what they say. Ten oh nine a.m. Number five is yawning again, especially when the witness tries to. Uh, I write contradict Curry, but I think she's like trying to argue about what Curry, Dr. Curry said, which is Johnny Depp's uh, witness, expert. Number two is writing some stuff down. Now, a couple of minutes later during a bench conference, number two looks like he's ready to go home, keeps his head down, rubs his eyes. Camille Vasquez is looking very underlined, cheerful today, smiling from ear to ear, underscored a lot. And there was a moment when I think, was it Camille? Uh, excuse me. Uh, was it Elaine? I think it was Elaine. Elaine calls Hughes Curry or she called Curry Hughes. One of those, like she just got the names mixed up and Camille Vasquez just bursts out laughing, like literally in her chair. She's just like, you're such a incompetent lawyer. That's basically just one lawyer to another. Like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, uh, Number two is asleep, question mark. His head is leaning over. Hughes doesn't come off as a professional at all. She's very condescending, very aggressive. And the jury collectively appears to distance themselves from her. So imagine like if you're sitting there listening to somebody and all it takes is just like a visible, you know, shift, just a slight shift. If you pay attention and you notice it, just when somebody tries to distance themselves from something, that means they don't like it or don't believe it usually uh, because they don't want to be close to it. When they lean in to something, that's when they're interested and they want to know more. So pay, pay, paying attention to body language is very, very important. Um, so I noticed that. <clears throat> I noticed that. Uh, number six at 10 16 a.m glares challengingly at elaine on direct examination of dr hughes now the fact that i use that word challengingly you can only imagine how that looked like like you know something like that i don't know i probably am doing it wrong i, I can't do it justice but that's what i wrote down glares challengingly at elaine on cross-examination. See that? <laughs> Glares challengingly. And I think it's because she was fed up with Elaine's bullshit. As we will see in a moment, there's a theme here as well with Elaine Bredehoff, one of the lawyers for Amber Heard. Uh, number two at this point yawns. This is 10, 16 in the morning. Number nine is, again, appears checked out. Ben Chu is face palming, also appears checked out. Meanwhile, um, uh, Camille Vasquez flips her hair. Number five rolls in his chair side to side. There's a very different atmosphere that is clouding the jury today, I write down. Hughes says something, quote, I do it in my office all the time, end quote, in reference to something. I don't know. I just wrote that down. But number eight at that moment rubs her eyes and raises her glasses. No notes. Nobody's taking notes at this point. I'm literally writing. I can't write fast enough. So much is happening. I wish I could type. It's in my notes. <laughs> at 10, 20 in the morning, uh, number one, stop looking at Hughes. He's staring down. Also appears checked out. Number eight looks at Elaine with a, are you done? Look on her face, which is incredible. Uh, number four, number six, and number seven, however, are still paying attention. Uh, 10, 21 in the morning, the defense has about 40 minutes remaining on their clock from my calculations, rough calculations. 
At some point, Hughes says something along the lines of she vehemently disagrees with something, I guess, Dr. Hughes said. Number one just rests his uh, chin on his fist. He is appearing to be very bored. Uh, the jury appears to be disinterested in Elaine and her side comments on how ill-prepared she is. Now, I found that fascinating. I remember... I don't remember the exact words. You can go back and look at the last day of testimony. But Elaine makes something along the lines of like, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm trying. I'm, I just need to get this, this, or the other. And the jury is just like, oh, my God. Like, you're wasting our time. Never, ever, 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 ever. Even if you're fumbling, admit to fumbling, number one. Just fumble, but don't say anything about it and get your shit together as quickly as you can. But on top of admitting your fumble to, like, make side comments, I mean, you know how insanely rude that is? Because you're keeping seven people uh, from, or, well, at the time, nine, but seven went to deliberate. So, excuse me, nine people you're holding captive while you're fumbling around, supposed to be the professional in the room doing your job on direct or cross or whatever of the witness, and you have control of the courtroom. Literally, all attention is on you. And you're just like, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sorry. This is, I'm screwing up. I apologize. It's just so incredibly rude because those nine people are sitting there and they're waiting for you to correct your behavior and get back on track. There is nothing more rude. I've had prosecutors do it to my juries. And I'm just like, please continue. Like, you are making me look like the best, most prepared person in the world. Fumble away. You know, I make it an active point to at least try. Sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes you will, you know, lose track of something. It's happened to me, but I will apologize. Excuse me. Just give me a moment. I need to find this one piece of paper here. Like, that's fine. But don't be like, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm trying. I'm, I'm not ready today. You know, like whatever she was doing. Quite crazy. Um, thank you for joining on as a member. Rico Costa, welcome to the channel. Um, Mad Scientist, do you mind sharing my, my email with uh, Rain Nation real quick? Thank you. Okay, so now begins the cross-examination. There's a bench conference right before the cross-examination begins, I believe, or as it's happening. And there's a bench conference during which Whitney, <clears throat> Amber's sister, looks back at the gallery, appears to be very distraught and exhausted. There's some discussion about, I think it's the Goldwater rule. I don't know. I just wrote the word golden and I, that nothing else. And there's like a diagram. I have no clue what I, but you can go back in the testimony. It's at 1020 something in the morning, uh, court time. And juror number five is seen yawning. Number seven and number eight are writing stuff down. And number two is looking very bored. Um, Ten twenty-eight in the morning, number two is nodding towards Dennison on cross-examination. So that was new. He even begins to smirk visibly when Dennison brings up the point of, quote, PCL tests should not be used as a standalone diagnostic tool. I even took that piece of testimony directly out and wrote it down because, like, number two was visibly smirking and nodding towards Dennison. That was huge, I thought, huge. Because if a juror agrees with you on cross-examination of the opposing party, you can kind of potentially in your mind gauge what side they're on. Not always. They may just be agreeing with this testimony, but sometimes it's it's universal. Uh, and you can deduce whatever conclusions from that, which at the time were still premature, but it looked like Johnny was winning. Just one fella's opinion. When Hughes gets argumentative, the jury begins to appear very aloof and disconnected. Um, there's something about reading directions that I guess Dennison brought out on cross-examination as we approach 1030 in the morning. Number eight scratches her head and even whelps her lips. 
I, I made, I, I've been tweeting about this all morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know what whelping means, this is what it looks like. That to me, that's how I read to whelp your lips. So if you're wondering like, what does it mean? What is whelping your lips? Screenshot this and like, if people ask like, what does whelping mean? What do you mean? This is what I mean. It's the, well, you tried. This is a little bit more expressive, of course, but it's just a simple, it's not pursing. Pursing is, whelping is this. It's kind of like rolling your eyes in a way. Yeah, exactly. Now there's a moment when Dennison doesn't even ask Hughes, or excuse me, ask the court if he can approach Hughes. He's oozing so much confidence. He just approaches her like point blank. He's got like so much energy. I nicknamed him Wayne Gigachad Dennison. And I write that I'm about to get wet in his pool of confidence. I mean, it was just so good. I wrote that I maintain that all of Amber Heard's witnesses look like unpolished gargoyles and I would personally never hire any of them for any of my cases. That's a direct quote from the notebook. Unpolished gargoyles. Like, you know those gargoyle statutes or the show gargoyles when they've been sitting out in the um, in the yard too long and nobody's cleaned them for like a couple decades? That's what her witnesses look like. I'm sorry. Agree, disagree, that's an observation. Um, <clears throat> so... Even the judge begins laughing at 10.35 in the morning about how much Hughes is argumentative with Dennison. There's a standard way that some things must be applied. I make a note to link one of my own YouTube videos of cross-examination of police officers. And the reason I wrote that at the time, I remember, you know, there's a certain standard way those of you who follow me on my on my channel for a long time and have seen my cross examination of police officers, if you haven't, absolutely go check them out. Um, but there's a standard way that standardized field sobriety tests must be administered, and if they're not, then their results are bogus. <clears throat> Dennison used the same thing out of like the playbook. I remember he had like a a whole chapter or something he was reading from, and he's like, "There's a standard way that it needs to be applied," and I'm like, "Oh my god, this is so much like my police officers." At 10.37 a.m., uh, number five is seen closing her eyes, maybe resting her eyes, one would say. Um, there is some testimony uh, by the Denison elicits. There's nothing in a box on a form at 10.37. Number two visibly nods aggressively. So we have some serious emotion, <clears throat> excuse me, being evoked from juror number two. Now, on redirect of Hughes, he, right at the beginning, juror number eight whelps her lips again at <clears throat> Dr. Hughes. And she's more interested in the people as they're arriving in the gallery. Uh, <laughs> I write, Hughes looks like the kind of woman that creates voodoo dolls of her exes and puts pins in them before she goes to bed every night, which I found to be kind of hilarious. But... I don't know. You may agree or disagree. Uh, juror number two nods at Elaine when the judge sustains Dennison's objection. Basically, I, I think he didn't like what Elaine was saying because Dennison objects, judge grants it, and the juror is like, mm. Number five is seen again resting her eyes. The defense has about 34 minutes remaining on the clock. Um, then we have the morning break. We come back at 11.05. 11.06. Now, now we come to the main event. Amber Heard herself once again back on the stand. Are you all ready for this? You're not ready for this. Yeah, you're ready for this. 11.05. We come back from break. About a minute later. Uh, Amber looks 
quite the stress during a bench conference. She even whelps her own lips herself. Now, I believe that was one of the first times I've ever seen her do that. So she's been fidgety. She's been kind of upset. She's been kind of, you know, uh, but this is the first time she is whelping herself. Unprecedented. Um, Vanessa makes the, the funny comment that James from court and Rottenborn are dressed the same way. And at 11, 10 in the morning on May the 26th, 2022, Amber Heard is back on the stand. The final witness on Sir Rebuttal for the defense in the case of Depp v. Heard. Right at the outset, juror number two appears to be the only one taking notes on direct examination, but then even he begins zoning out on her. Um, number one and juror number two are writing stuff down on, as she testifies about her trauma and inability to work. And now here comes the magical moment that I was telling you at the beginning of this video that you will uh, get to hear for the first time 15 months almost since the trial, since this day happened. Amber, you may remember, testified on the stand in court that she received thousands of death threats. And I just wrote literally, thank you, Amber, in my notes. Why? Because what she did is something unprecedented. This is a case about the op-ed, what impact it had on Johnny, and what, if any, damages he may be entitled to. She, by saying that, I received thousands of death threats, basically over the course of this trial, has literally brought the internet into the courtroom. And it was 100% objectionable and irrelevant but Camille, who was the one that is going to cross her in a few minutes, made the right call. She did not object. She let Amber testify to that because it only helps Johnny. It shows what the people, what we outside actually think about her. Because people we love, we don't send them death threats. Johnny did not testify to receiving death threats, probably because he didn't get any. But the fact that she's like, oh, look, poor me. I'm receiving so many death threats, not realizing the consequences of her actions, whether true or false. Now, if it's true, that is really unfortunate. You should not be, you know, attacking a person on social media is one thing. People do it all the time. But to like send private DMs, which again, anytime Amber speaks, I always take it with a grain of salt. So when she says thousands, I think she may have gotten like five or six, maybe 10 over the course of like six months, uh, excuse me, six weeks, you know, that's not a bad average. Uh, especially she probably deserved a whole lot more. Um, but still, th there's no point in sending them. They, they don't accomplish anything. They just, what do you do? Release your anger? It's not cool. Don't send death threats. They're just, they're, they're bad karma for you. And they, they don't, they, it, you don't, you don't accomplish anything. But the fact that she said, I've received thousands of death threats was huge for Johnny because the jury at that moment realized, wow, it's not just us that don't like this woman. Those people in the gallery, potentially, and everybody outside this courthouse, this courtroom, don't like her either. And it validated their personal beliefs in that second. So if anybody wants to talk about bringing social media into the courtroom, by the way, i.e. Netflix documentary, um, she is the one who crucified her own case with that one statement alone. Now, obviously, that was not the, the final nail in the coffin or anything crazy like that. It was just another piece of material, but it probably gave the jurors a sense of confidence that, hey, I was going to rule this way anyway. This was my decision anyway, but thank you for reaffirming that I'm making the correct one. You see the difference? Um, that's what I felt in that moment. Uh, she starts talking about, she hopes to reclaim like her, her career or something. 
I don't know. I just wrote Hope to Reclaim, and I imagine it has something to do with her glory, her her career, her acting career, whatever. Uh, jurors number six and seven have absolutely zero emotional reaction to the tantrums that she's throwing in court. Um, and then she has that, I tweeted about this. She has that statement about, I protected the secret for what I did as long as I did, blah, blah, blah. Jurors number five and nine, and I think eight as well, look at her kind of skeptically. Uh, then there's a bench conference. The defense has about 26 minutes remaining on the clock at this point. They're running out of time fast. Um, but she's their last witness. We just didn't know at the time. During the bench conference, jurors number two and number eight look in our direction. So they're looking at me, James, and Vanessa. And they're looking at the entire courtroom. The entire courtroom can't stop talking. It's very audible. And even the bailiffs are smirking, but no one is quieting us. No one is telling us to shush. Everyone is just a chatter, probably because it's Amber back on the stand and nobody's believing her. I think everybody just wants to talk about it. Um, Amber constantly has her chin up. She will not even look at Legal Tube's direction. Uh, when she does look, she has this new whelp that I was talking about. There it is. She has this new whelp look on her face. And I've never seen it before. Now I saw it twice. So this is the second time now. Um, the curly-haired lawyer turns around and exchanges a whelp look on his lips with Whitney. Like there's whelp faces being thrown around everywhere on her side and towards her and her team from other people. It's, it, it, again, in hindsight 2020, of course. But the fact that there's a pattern emerging is saying a lot. That well, that, that whelp face, it's like a face of defeat. It's like a, well, you tried. We've done everything we could, you know. Well, sorry. Didn't work out. My bad. You know, it's it's that same vibe. And then I tweeted a picture of this. This is my, so these are my predictions. Um, it is over. AH will lose. At this moment, I'm like so confident. I even write it down. Johnny Depp, in my humble opinion, has an 80% chance of getting 7 million, 50% um, chance of getting 14 million, 25% chance of getting 25 million or more. I, it looks like I changed my, my opinion. It originally was like 10%. And then a 1% chance of him getting every dollar he asked for up to the entire $50 million amount. Uh, looks like he ended up getting, as we all know, 15 million from the jury. So I was, I was close. <laughs> Uh, it ended up being reduced statutorily, but hey, it's what the jury actually ordered. That's that's what we were going for. Uh, so the defense has about 25, 26 minutes. And now Camille Vasquez at 11.32 in the morning begins the cross-examination of Amber Heard. And this is the first time I have seen a snarl from a jurors. A snarl, as you all know, is kind of like a, you know, it's like a snarl uh type look it's a disgusted look number six visibly snarls when amber heard says quote i never lied end quote to some question camille asks her now i tweeted this and i couldn't remember uh, there was a question by camille about hickville and morgan knight and when amber says i don't recognize that man quote, unquote, the entire courtroom gasped, like collectively. It was like a, <gasps> just, you, it, it was so bad. Now in hindsight, I remember uh, vaguely, very vaguely, but I remember that moment because it was quite emotional. Um, Because she was, she was asked a very easy point blank question. You know, a man took the stand and he was having Johnny Depp and Amber Heard as guests at his, uh, hotel. I think it was in Tennessee. I can't remember Florida, Tennessee. Y'all can correct me, please, in the comments, um, uh, in the chat. And she was like, I don't recognize that man talking about Morgan Knight. Oh, it's, it just looked so bad. It's like, you're a liar through and through, and you just have no shame about lying through your teeth. You think you're gaslighting the world. All you're doing is just burying yourself further and further. Um, it was so bad. It was really bad. 
And then she says something like, you know, calling this whole trial the Johnny Depp show. That came from her mouth, by the way, if you all remember. She was the first one to say it uh, in court. Now, we may have been saying it on social media. That's fine. We have a right to do that. You are a witness uh, and a defendant in a defamation trial. You don't have a right to say that. When she said it, it was also like a, ooh. You remember that? that there's a meme, right? The, ooh meme like the ooh, ooh. don't don't say that that was like the that moment that i had when she said that and the jurors were completely non-reactive to that statement number two again appeared pretty checked out by 11 30 something in the morning uh then everyone begins listening quite intently uh as amber heard's responses and turns to the jury Oh, so her response is, and she's like, you know, Camille asks her a question. She turns to the jury, answer, question, answer, question, answer. I think I tweeted to the judge because I just wrote J, but I think it's to the jury. Question, answer. And she's so robotic. I think the jury can't seem to be able to find a way to relate to her. Uh, if you all remember, again, you can rewatch. It was like the last 30 minutes of her testimony on um, on. Uh, cross-examination by Camille Vasquez on the, the final day, May 26th, 2022. Uh, and then, I think I wrote it was number seven, but I have them flipped. Number It's either number seven or number two also snarls at Amber. There was two jurors now out of nine that have snarled at her direction. Again, not a good sign. Welping towards her, snarling towards her, looking down at the floor, distancing themselves. Like all that body language is not good if you're the one testifying. You want people to lean in and listen and nod and go, oh my goodness, maybe scratch their chin, go, wow. And it doesn't have to be so blatant, but just like a simple, you know, or like a, you know. But if you're doing kind of like a, Those are all bad. You don't want to have people reacting this way to what you're saying. Um, it was a very interesting moment, by the way, as I was going through, I told you I saw episode one of the Depp v. Heard uh, Netflix documentary, which I do not recommend. It's complete garbage. But I just watched it for the sake of watching it because I had time this morning and I wanted to familiarize myself with what the hell is going on there. There was a moment... What I completely forgot about when Johnny testifies about something that Amber said about him, like hitting her or slapping her or something. And he's actually kind of chuckling. He's kind of laughing. And you can tell he's not laughing at the, oh, yeah, I hit her. So what? It's a, I can't believe she actually said that. And you can tell it's very clearly telegraphed because it's the truth. It's like he's chuckling. It's like, of course I didn't do that. Like, what are you even talking about? Of course I didn't. And a true abuser, like a true honest to God abuser would never, I think in a million years, be able to come off so genuine and confident and to laugh at their victim and be uh, appearing very genuine about it as they're talking about it. Because the collective response was, yeah, we don't believe her either, Johnny. You know what I mean? It was quite fascinating to just revisit that that um, that moment. It was really bizarre. Really bizarre. But at the same time, it's so genuine. Like, he can actually smirk and laugh at that because he knows how ridiculous it is and how ridiculous it sounds. And that's very powerful. You, There is not a acting studio in the universe that can prepare you to lie like that. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. That's how we knew that he was telling the truth about the fact that he never never hit her, never touched her, never touched any woman as far as we're concerned. Uh, he just doesn't seem like the type anyway. Um, number seven is leaning back at Amber and is smirking at some comment about video editing, her editing videos. I think Camille at this point is grilling her about video editing and her editing some of the videos. 
And uh, number two, excuse me, number seven, I think here is leaning back and smirking. I got them, I got them crisscrossed applesauce. So <laughs> um, Amber Heard now for the third time has a whelp look on her face on the video editing testimony, which does not look helpful to her case, nor to the jury. So just getting worse and worse. Thanks for being a member for six months, Lily. Welcome, welcome back. Um, yeah, I wasn't punching you, I was hitting you. That was an admission by Amber. If nothing else, literally Amber admitted. Those two things, by the way, I will give credit where credit is due. The documentary does uh, have the clip of, I wasn't punching you, I was hitting you. And they do have the clip of, Go tell the world, Johnny, go tell the world that I, a man, am also a victim of domestic abuse. Like, nobody's going to believe you. So credit where credit is due, at least they included those two clips because those two right there are the entire trial, like cover to cover. If you want to skip everything and just listen to those two clips, that's the entire trial in a nutshell, by the way. Um, now there's a, some... Uh, Camille goes really in, like she digs her heels into Amber, talking about a photo after the date that she was allegedly abused and there is no bruise. Number two and number nine are damn near falling out of their chairs. They're so interested in that testimony. Um, at 11.48 in the morning, Amber Heard appears as though even she herself is not buying her bullshit anymore. Like, that's where the point she's gotten to. She's tried every angle. It's failing miserably. And she's just like, she has this, I got the publicity I wanted. Can I please go home now? It's quite fascinating. Like, humans are, you, your mouth can lie, but your body will always give you away. Remember that. At 11.52, juror number two has checked out. Uh, especially when Amber Heard tries to argue with Camille on cross-examination and argue to the jury without a question. If you all remember, there was a, a, a lot of moments when Amber is just, Camille does not ask a question and she just starts talking at the jury. And Camille's like, Ms. Heard, Ms. Heard, Ms. Heard. There was no question being asked. There is no question pending. Ms. Heard, there is no question pending. Ms. Heard, I did not ask you a question. Remember those moments on the last day, in those last few minutes? Um, the jury is not impressed at all, especially number two, who's completely checked out. Um, number five, juror number five is probably Team Depp after today, I wrote. I'm, I'm not sure why I wrote that. I think we thought number five may have been Team Amber just because of her stoic face, but we never, obviously, we never had any confirmation. Now we know that they were all team Depp. Um, jury just stops reacting to her uh, after a while. Um, no emotional reaction to her tantrums. She keeps saying the words like, like Camille will ask her a simple question like da, 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 da. And uh, Amber will turn to the jury. You may remember this. She'll turn to the jury and go incorrect. And then give her answer. And I'm like, and she said the word incorrect so many times. I literally wrote in capital letters, stop saying, quote unquote, incorrect. You sound like a computer. And it's not helping your case. At noon, Camille is done with her, literally and figuratively. Um, the redirect of Amber, again, she sounds very scripted. Number two and number nine won't even look at Amber anymore on redirect, even though she glares at the jury, scanning them constantly. I think for confirmation, are do they believe me? You know, that sort of thing. Like, are they are they buying it? Are they buying it? That's what liars do a lot of times. They'll scan and see, like, is it working? Is it working? Are they listening? Are they buying it? You know. Um, number two and number nine are locked on Rottenborn at one point, which is very interesting to see. Uh, there was a question of Amber, did Johnny Depp abuse you? Jury's completely non-responsive. Number nine is so done with Amber Heard. And this is when I, I knew, like I knew number nine is always has been and will be our favorite. Uh, he is so done with her. I wrote, if gays could talk, he was literally saying, 
get this woman out of my courtroom. This is what I wrote. It's the most hilarious thing I've ever written, I think. Um, number nine is so done with Amber Heard. If gays could talk, his gaze was literally saying, quote, please get this woman out of my courtroom, end quote. And I wanted to show you that because I think it's so powerful because I know it's not his courtroom. It's it's all it's a choice of words thing. I know it's not his courtroom. He's just a juror, but he just had such a I am so done. Like I'm ready to make my decision. Will you please shut up, sit down, and let me do my job? Look on his face that it, it's just priceless. I had to write it down. Um the defense has 23 minutes, and they end up, of course, not using it. Uh, but they came very, very close to the mark, too close for comfort. Meanwhile, Johnny's team is still sitting on almost seven hours worth of if they really wanted to call anybody, uh, but they didn't because the, the point was made. And even though you have a reservoir, it doesn't mean you have to use it. Just because you can continue talking, sometimes it's good to shut up and sit down if the point was made. A lot of lawyers, inexperienced lawyers especially, forget that mark. By the way, speaking of inexperienced lawyers, uh, Never hire inexperienced lawyers to represent you, such as Elaine Bredehoft and uh, Ben Rottenborn. You want to hire experienced lawyers like Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez because they lead to these types of mugs being made. You lost Amber, have a mega pint, and you lost because you had a shit team. Maybe with a better team, you could have done better. I mean, it's just facts. Facts don't win cases. Lawyers win cases. You all ever heard that? There's a lot of truth to it. There's a lot of truth to it. And a good bullshitter a good, good, good bullshitter like Johnny Cochran, um, uh, what's his name, Kardashian, um, uh, Shapiro, they're good fucking bullshitters. And they can win cases uh, that are probably unwinnable. So if she had a team like that, maybe she would have won. But uh, you lost, Amber. So here, have a mega pint. Link is in the description below. Go get yours today. Mwah. I love these things. Um, so yeah, 1203 in the afternoon. Um, that's the end of Amber Heard on redirect. I think there's like a quick bench conference and, uh, 1206, the, the defense rests, there's sir rebuttal. We go on lunch break. We come back at like 10 minutes to one, uh, and we get released. It's over closing arguments the next day. That is the day that I did not get in. So I did not tweet about this. I wanted to save this exclusively for you all. This is the last day. I only have less than a page. I even I even uh, scribbled some stuff at the bottom. I, I tore it off because I did not want it uh, preserved for whatever reason. I actually don't remember what it was, but I was like, I don't like it in there. I tore it out, and it stayed that way, of course. I wrote, I got booted, so I'm writing this from my home. Well, Karen's house. I was sitting there with Legal Vices, Nick Ricada, and somebody else. I call him Free Book, but he, <laughs> just because he always had like freebook.com on his description. Um, it was the four of us, I believe. I wrote, not much to write. I was in a really depressing fucking mood. Like I was really depressed. Uh, I wrote, not much to write. I cannot see anything, obviously, except what they're showing on the screen that is publicly available. So it's not the same feel as looking at the jury and giving your um, your opinion. Plus, I feel a bit gloomy due to all this drama, so my energy is low. I will say that Camille Vasquez is doing a great job, and you can feel the emotion in her voice. I don't even make a single note about Rottenborn and Elaine, or even Ben, just because they were so disjointed and bad. Um because they had nothing to talk about and they're not good lawyers. No offense to them. Eh, fuck it. Offense to them. Also shout out to Chanley from court TV for this pen. Cause it's multicolored. See, I'm like, I'm writing in red, purple, blue, black. She gave me her pen, which I still have, by the way, I think I do. It's probably somewhere. That's it. That's the end of it. That finishes our notebook. Um, kind of uh, surreal kind of surreal that 15 months later here we are 
finishing our quest. It's almost like a final piece to the chapter, if you will. Um, anyway, don't forget to get your pint glasses. Thank you all for joining me. I love every single one of you. This has been so much fun. It's almost like the final chapter in the book of Depp v. Heard. Don't go watch the documentary. It is trash. If you've seen the trial, you've seen it all. I love every single one of you, and I will see you all next time. Bye, everybody.